So let me start with a particular historical moment. In November of 1964, when Lyndon Johnson posted a historic landslide victory over Senator Barry Goldwater, the nation's most prominent conservative and the unchallenged leader of those who identified with the conservative movement in the United States. Carrying more than 60% of the popular vote, LBJ's coattail swept in a liberal majority in both houses of the Congress, paving the way for the enactment of the Great Society, the most far-reaching expansion of federal government authority since Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Goldwater's defeat profoundly disillusioned many on the American right. One committed conservative, the manager of a North Carolina television station whose programming sought to offer an alternative to the liberal national media, could not hide his disappointment. To tell you the truth, Jesse Helms confided to a friend, the events around us have tended to bring on a feeling of depression. Every day we say that it can't get any worse, and the next day it gets worse. I wonder if all of us aren't wasting our breath. Yet, just eight years later, Jesse Helms himself won election to the U.S. Senate, becoming the first North Carolina Republican to win such an office in a century. In that same year, 1972, the man that Helms backed for president, and with whom he had been collaborating since the 1950s, Richard Nixon, won his own dazzling victory, capturing 49 out of the 50 states against South Dakota Senator George McGovern. Rejecting the liberalism that McGovern represented, Americans seemed to embrace a popular slogan of that year, the government that governs best, McGovern's least. Flash forward just another eight years, and the reversal seemed almost complete. In November 1980, Ronald Wilson Reagan, the Republican candidate for president, scored a monumental triumph. In that election, the ex-actor from Illinois by way of Hollywood was not only the Republican Party's standard bearer, he was. Unlike previous Republican candidates, Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon, Dwight Eisenhower, for Reagan was also the leader and the most prominent figure in American conservatism. He was an avowed conservative who had first entered national politics in 1964 to campaign for Barry Goldwater, that father figure of modern American conservatism, before serving as California governor and running two unsuccessful efforts in 1968 and again in 1976 for the Republican presidential nomination. Reagan's victory marked the arrival of the conservative movement as a dominant force in American public life, and its grip has steadily tightened over the next 25, 30, 40 years almost, 30, 30 years now, so that its power and its prominence seem to us today almost normal, expected, matter of fact. Yet Reagan's victory was truly stunning, stunning in two different senses of that word. First, it was stunning in its size and its scope. Reagan captured 44 of the 50 states. He won in the Deep South, defeating a Georgia Democrat, Jimmy Carter. He won in his adopted Far West, of course. But he even won in some of the strongholds of Rust Belt liberalism. He took Michigan with all of its union workers. He even won a narrow majority in my home state of Massachusetts, the one state that had voted for McGovern previously. And his victory had coattails. For the first time in a quarter century since 1954, the Republicans captured control of the U.S. Senate, and in the process, some of the most prominent liberal Democrats in the Senate went down in defeat. Second, 1980 was stunning, stunning as in just plain surprising, unexpected. For conservatives who had toiled their whole lives in the political wilderness, who had endured irrelevance in the 1950s and the liberal politics and cultural upheaval of the 60s, Reagan's victory seemed almost as miraculous as Joshua's biblical campaigns. Tonight's lecture, then, is an investigation of this thunder on the right, the rise of conservatism into a potent ideological and political force, one that has exerted enduring impact on American public life. To do so, I'd like to investigate with you several complex historical problems. 
So first, I'd like to explore the origins of the modern conservative movement in the early post-World War II period, a period in which even the right's most dedicated believers admitted their lack of influence on American politics. Second, I want to turn our attention to the conservative breakout of the 1960s, the political mobilization that culminated in the nomination of Barry Goldwater and the conservative takeover of the Republican Party. Third, the road to Reagan's victory, the key developments of the 1970s that made possible the Reagan revolution and the conservative ascendancy in American politics. And then finally, we'll speculate briefly on the legacy of modern American conservatism and its current standing after the victory in 2008 of Barack Obama and the midterm elections of this previous November. So let me get started. Now we should begin by remembering that the decades before the 1970s, really from the 1930s through the mid-1960s, were not kind to American conservatism. Conservatives had no real mass constituency as the vast majority of Americans embraced the liberal New Deal coalition. Conservatives had no coherence. Bitterly divided among themselves, they could not agree ideologically or come together organizationally. And conservatives had no real home. The Republican Party was dominated by a moderate Eastern establishment, purveyors of what their leader, President Dwight Eisenhower, called modern republicanism. And modern Republicans were those who accepted the broad outlines of the New Deal order, things like Social Security and labor unions. They were willing to negotiate with the Soviets and unwilling to go to war to roll back communism. And they were suspicious of overt, overly enthusiastic displays in public life of either religious piety or patriotic enthusiasm. So I'm thinking about people like Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s and New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller in the 1960s. And even the temperamentally much more conservative Richard Nixon had to make peace with liberal Eastern Republicans to advance his career. So to give you an idea of where the political spectrum lay, where the political center lay in the 1950s, um, um, during the Eisenhower administration, labor unions reached their peak, representing more than 30% of all workers. Today, by contrast, it's 12%, and only 7% of the private, non-governmental labor force. And during the 1950s, the sharply progressive federal income tax maxed out at marginal rates above 90%. Today's top bracket for the wealthiest, thanks to the extension of the the latest round of Bush tax cuts is 35%. And to give you an idea, and despite all our consternation about taxes today, in 2010, federal taxes as a share of national income were the lowest they had been since 1950, when the mobilization for the Korean War began. So during this early post-war period then, conservatives toiled in the wilderness, in fringe organizations, second-rate colleges, largely unread publications. To quote one movement conservative, in the 50s and 60s, the movement of organized conservative groups was long on egotists, hucksters, and eccentrics, all engaged in a childish sandbox politics. So weak was conservatism, so lacking in organization and power, that leading thinkers dismissed the right as nothing more than a bunch of irrational kooks. In an influential volume, published in 1955 called The New American Right, a group of prominent Ivy League professors concluded that America lacked altogether a genuine, legitimate conservative tradition. Instead of real conservatives, people who believe in tradition, who uphold order, the United States harbored only what they called a radical right, irrational extremists like the followers of Senator Joseph McCarthy. The American right, according to these luminaries, did not offer a respectable or even a rational response to communism, big government, or any other important issue, but rather constituted a pseudo-conservative revolt by frustrated, maladjusted, uneducated yahoos unable to cope with the complexities of modern life 
and tending to see conspiracies under every rock. The atmosphere of this book, The New American Right, was more, of, more that of a clinic, seeing conservatism as a problem of abnormal psychology rather than as a serious political movement. And believe it or not, even conservatives thought of themselves as marginal in the late 40s and 1950s, as a remnant keeper, keeping the flickering flame of truth alive. Now, who made up this remnant? Well, even during the wilderness years, there were conservatives, of course, but they were not united, not an organized movement with a coherent set of principles. To gain influence, to win power, to emerge from the wilderness, American conservatives needed an organizer to give the movement coherence and a unified forum, needed a leader to inspire and rally around, needed a grassroots movement, a cadre of activists, organizers, fundraisers, and needed communicators, spokespersons, that could take what seemed to many like an extreme, unpalatable philosophy and make it appeal to a broad swath of the American electorate. Well, a handful of actors would play a leading role in this process. And first among these voices in the wilderness I want to look at tonight is this man, William F. Buckley, Jr. A Roman Catholic, son of a self-made millionaire in the oil industry, Buckley grew up living the life of an aristocrat. After attending Yale College and making his name as the editor of the college newspaper for his attacks on the alleged liberalism and atheism of the institution's faculty, and after a brief stint as a CIA agent in Mexico, Buckley invested some of his inheritance and launched at the age of 30 in 1955 National Review, a journal of conservative opinion. Now, many of you are probably thinking, as did many of Buckley's uh, uh, contemporaries, that a highbrow magazine seemed a very unlikely place to launch a political movement, but Buckley understood his historical moment. Responding to a critic who urged him to reach out more to the average voter, Buckley replied his words, we feel that before it is possible to bring the entire nation around politically, we have to engage the attention of people who for a long time have felt that the conservative position is moribund. Once we have engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the best the liberals can furnish and bested them, then we can proceed to present a realistic political alternative around which the American right, at present so terribly disintegrated, can close ranks. So Buckley's key role then was to unite the disparate factions of conservatism, bringing together anti-communists, traditionalists, and free marketeers, and giving them a common forum in the pages and in the offices of his National Review. Buckley also helped legitimate the movement by distancing it from the quirkier, more violent, more paranoid extremist elements on the American right. And to do that, he had to negotiate a delicate relationship with some of the most committed believers and most dedicated conservative activists, namely the followers of Robert Welch. Now Welch was something of a prodigy. He graduated from college at the age of 16, and he became a successful candy manufacturer. He made sugar daddies and junior mints. Like many entrepreneurs, he came to abhor government regulation, and during the 1950s, Welch became a financial backer of Joseph McCarthy and threw himself into anti-communist pamphleteering. In 1958, he founded an organization to teach Americans about the dangers of communist subversion naming it in honor of a Baptist missionary who had been killed by Chinese communists. The John Birch Society claimed that communists controlled not only prominent liberal organizations, such as the NAACP or the American Civil Liberties Union, but also reached even into the highest levels of the U.S. government. President Eisenhower, Welch claimed with flat certainty, was, I quote, a dedicated conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. Well, while initially accepting money from Welch and understanding the John Burt Society's huge appeal among his base, Buckley carefully distanced National Review and the nascent conservative movement from Welch 
and his conspiratorial zeal and denounced what he called the irresponsible right. Finally, Buckley also proved a transformative figure because he helped give the conservative movement youthful energy, a presence on college campuses, and some real organizational muscle. And the principal conservative youth organization, Young Americans for Freedom, or YAF, was founded at Buckley's estate in Sharon, Connecticut in 1960. Not incidentally, around right, the same time that SDS was forming uh, on the other side of the political spectrum. The second key figure of the wilderness era was this man, Lemuel Boulware. Now, during the late 1940s, General Electric made Boulware its vice president for employee and community relations. When Boulware took the post, GE, like most major American businesses, was finding itself in a losing battle with organized labor. Because even victories for management seemed like defeats. Think about it. In a typical negotiation, both sides ask for more than they expect in the final result and usually settle somewhere in the middle. So even if a settlement went mainly management's way, the union can claim that it had won some concession from the other side. Well, under Boulware's direction, GE attacked the perception that unions accomplished anything for their members. Management would meet with union representatives, take notes in silence, but refuse to engage in give and take bargaining. Instead, GE would reveal its offer to workers and to the whole community with great media fanfare. And regardless of what the union did, that was the final offer. But bulwarism, as this practice was soon called, was more than a strategy to maximize General Electric's profits. Unusually, perhaps, for a corporate executive, Bulware's vision extended far beyond his own company. Bulware not only fought unions, he waged a huge systematic campaign to inculcate the virtues of the free market, a PR operation that included leaflets, magazines, advertising, and sponsorships of TV series and speaker tours. And of course, GE recruited a then fading movie star named Ronald Reagan to preach the free market ideology in the 1950s at a time when relatively few Americans were heeding the message. The final key figure of the wilderness era was Barry Goldwater, who became modern American conservatism's first popular leader. Now, as I've mentioned, the Republican Party of the 1950s was dominated by moderate modern republicanism, and especially by its Northeastern establishment. Sure, the pages of National Review and a handful of conservative foundations had created a respectable headquarters for the emerging movement. But as one prominent conservative put it in a letter to Buckley, he enjoyed reading the kinds of articles he found in National Review, but the right had to find an appeal that, quote, means something to masses of people. If you were a Marine in a landing boat, he asked, would you wade up the sea beach for the conservative philosophizing of intellectuals? Well, Goldwater was able to energize rank and file conservatives in that way. He was no creature of the Eastern establishment, but rather a Southwesterner, a small businessman, and an uncompromising opponent of big government. Elected to the Senate in 1952, Goldwater made his reputation as a defender of Joseph McCarthy, a staunch critic of unions, and a reliable vote against any government spending, even programs that were popular in his home state. After his reelection in 1958, Goldwater bolstered his national reputation by criticizing President Eisenhower and by writing, How Do You Stand, Sir?, a weekly column syndicated in 140 newspapers across the United States, which was really collected and turned into a book published in 1960 called The Conscience of a Conservative. Touring the country, Goldwater electrified grassroots conservatives with his bold, frank, no-holds-barred speeches. He became the clear champion of the conservative movement, the hero of those on the right who wanted the Republican Party to offer a radical alternative to liberalism, not just a milder version of it. Unlike earlier Republican leaders, Goldwater would offer, in one supporter's words, a choice, not an echo. And indeed, 
he advocated positions that none of his Republican rivals would have considered. Elimination of favored government programs, even of the beloved social security system. Opposition to the Civil Rights Act. Escalation of the Cold War, including possible use of tactical nuclear weapons. In 1960, conservative activists wanted to draft Goldwater as a Republican presidential nominee. But not only could they not succeed in replacing the heir apparent, Vice President Richard Nixon, at the top of the ticket, they even failed to get Nixon to consider a conservative as his running mate. He chose instead that ultimate moderate Eastern establishment figure, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts. But four years later, in 1964, movement conservatives would take a leading role in the Republican Party, and Barry Goldwater would become the party's presidential candidate. Crucial to that transformation was the mobilization of a huge grassroots effort, one that went forward largely without Goldwater's participation. After all, the senator realized that voters were hardly likely to oust the then popular president, Lyndon Johnson, who had promised to complete the agenda of the martyred John F. Kennedy. Still, groups like YAF were in the field, and after endorsing Goldwater for president early in 1963, the student group began efforts to win Republican caucuses in many states. And if YAF was organizing young, committed foot soldiers for Goldwater and conservatism, a group of, shall we say, lieutenants, slightly older conservatives, chaired by a man named F. Clifton White, brought together conservative activists to plan a takeover of the Republican Party in 1964. Now, from the start, White and others intended to rally around Goldwater as their standard bearer. But I want to emphasize that nominating Goldwater was not their main objective. Their main goal was promoting conservatism and turning the Republicans into a conservative party. They saw Goldwater as a vehicle to their larger aims. His candidacy was not their aim. And in fact, Goldwater and his close allies were skeptical. He realized they had very little chance of winning. He didn't want to make himself a sacrificial lamb. But eventually, and eventually he announced that he would not seek the presidential nomination. Well, that left Clifton White and his allies in a bind. So they decided in one of their colorful language that they were going to, I quote, draft the son of a bitch anyway. And they set up the National Draft Goldwater Committee. Well, crucial to this effort were not only young conservatives on college campuses, but an impressive network of so-called suburban warriors concentrated in the fast-growing places like Orange County, California, around Fort Worth, Texas, which called itself Free Enterprise City, in Phoenix and Scottsdale, Arizona, the northern suburbs of Atlanta, and numerous other places. That is, outside the traditional centers of political power and cultural authority in the industrial north. Now, although many of these people embraced evangelical Protestant religion and bemoaned what they saw as threats to America's identity as a Christian republic, we'll have more on them later, they were certainly not the ignorant yahoos afraid of modernism that had seemed to fill the far right during the 1950s. These people were highly educated, thoroughly modern group of men and women, professionals, workers in high-tech industries, active participants in American consumer culture. They had cut their political teeth in numerous small-scale local battles. Um, um, and numerous small-scale local battles, most of them having to do with things like school board elections, control over education, textbooks, and programs in the schools. They set up numerous local and regional organizations and also a vast social network of bridge clubs, barbecues, and coffee clutches, all of which, of course, were popular activities in the new growing suburban communities. So they, pro they provided opportunities to spread right-wing politics and ideas from home to home. So here you see uh, in Orange County, um, you can buy, uh, you can buy uh, 
AUH2O, so that's silver, uh, that's gold water, right? The, uh, the, the chemical symbol for gold is AUH2O, gold water, or you could buy gold water, 64 gold, and you can make, you know, tablecloths, napkins, dresses, whatever you want, uh, whatever you, you want out of that. So these networks had really organized, oh, I don't have the, uh, I'm, missing, I'm missing a slide here. But these uh, networks had organized in the 1950s in such campaigns as a successful effort to ban instructional materials produced by the United Nations from the schools in Los Angeles. And they went into overdrive early in 1964 during the draft Goldwater movement. Now eventually this proved so successful that Goldwater decided to enter the race and at the 1964 Republican Convention in San Francisco, conservative dreams seemed to come true. <laughs> Liberal Republicans tried to insert planks in the party platform, criticizing Goldwater's willingness to use nuclear weapons and condemning the John Burt Society and right-wing extremism. Conservative delegates voted both of them down. When New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller, the leader of establishment Eastern Republicans, addressed the convention, Goldwater supporters shouted him down with boos and catcalls. They succeeded in nominating an all-conservative ticket, and they got from Goldwater an acceptance speech geared not toward healing breaches, unifying the party, and moving to the center, the usual purpose of such speeches, but a shocking statement of unbending purpose. He welcomed, quote, anyone who joins us in all sincerity, but declared that the party had no place for any who do not care for our cause. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, he told the cheering crowd. Moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Now, I don't seek the presidency. Uh oh, what happened there? Now, I don't seek the presidency. Uh oh, well, okay, well, we're going to hear. Barry Gold, we tested this right before, I don't know what happened to that, but uh, we were going to hear Barry Goldwater there, and he was going to make these very bold-faced statements. In fact, one reporter, upon hearing those words, said, I quote him now, Oh my God, he's actually going to run as Barry Goldwater. <laughs> the Republican slogan that year was, In your heart, you know he's right. Yes, far right, said his opponents. And most Americans, the overwhelming majority, rejected Goldwater in 1964, declaring, uh, deciding as the opposing slogan went, not in your heart you know he's right, but in your guts you know he's nuts. <laughs> Still, despite that defeat, the Goldwater campaign proved crucial in the development of modern conservatism. It culminated a grassroots effort by young conservatives to take over the Republican Party, to make it into a conservative party. And if you don't believe how formative these figures were um, in the rise of modern conservatism, um, here I think is that, well, now we're, we're stuck all together there. Oh well. What do you think? Shall we? I don't know, do you want to, I'll, I'll go on and maybe we'll, he, he can get us back to, to where we were. Um, what I was going to show you here was um, uh, uh, Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito's application for his first government job in the Reagan administration, and he writes on it that he was, you know, that, that he was moved to his political stance by reading National Review under, under um, uh, William F. Buckley and by, uh, by participating in the 1964 Goldwater campaign and how influential those things, those things were for him. So even if they did not succeed, they did make conservatism a force to be reckoned with, indeed the dominant force within the National Republican Party. The party's candidate in 1968 and all subsequent Republican standard bearers would have to reckon with and make peace with the conservative movement. So when he ran in 1960, Nixon chose a Massachusetts moderate as his running mate. In 1968, he chose an outspoken conservative. More important, the conservative awakening of the early 1960s planted the seeds for, a, for eventual victory. It laid the foundations in three crucial ways. So first, these 1960s era efforts gave birth to the New Right Network, to the infrastructure of organizations, lobbying groups, think tanks, foundations, 
and to the base of professional activists that would staff the so-called new right of the 1970s and 1980s. Thank you. Led by veterans of Young Americans for Freedom and the Goldwater Campaign, movement leaders like the organizational guru Richard Vigory assembled a vast conservative network. All right, let's see if we get the next one there. Yes, we, all right. So that, that was the Goldwater Campaign. Here's Richard Vigory and his staff here in his computer uh, center. Now, this network consciously mirrored liberal activists and organizations like the NAACP, the Sierra Club, Planned Parenthood, and they tapped into a number of existing and newly formed single issue groups like the National Rifle Association and several right to life organizations. These groups could mobilize millions of people around hot button issues like gun control and abortion. Um, um, another uh, one of the issues that, uh, that they really could mobilize was about uh, was textbooks. So uh, Alice Moore, who ran a campaign for a local school board in West Virginia, became the subject of the whole national conservative movement. People flooded in, giving organizational advice, money, to support this effort to elect a conservative slate to the school board in West Virginia. Just one example of the, the way this, uh, this movement worked. Another thing was the, um, the um, uh, uh, anti-homosexual uh, movement uh, here, led by or famously associated with former beauty queen uh, Anita, Anita Bryant, um, who led a success, successful efforts to uh, ban homosexuals from teaching in the schools in, in several places, in, in Florida, in Oregon, and so on. And uh, I love this, uh, this particular one here where, um, where uh, she, um, uh, a, an, an opposition activist throws a pie in her face, but as it says, she immediately prayed for the forgiveness of the one who, uh, who threw the pie. <laughs> so you've got these single issue groups. Then you have multi-issue, broad-spectrum conservative organizations that formed another component of the New Right Network. Groups like the Conservative Caucus, the Heritage Foundation, and NICPAC, the National Conservative Political Action Committee. While these groups lacked the mass support of the NRA or the pro-life movement, they could map out broad-based conservative agendas and organize those pressure groups into an effective movement, teaching techniques of lobbying, fundraising, and grassroots organizing. They schooled local and single issue cons constituencies in protest tactics, helped them qualify ballot initiatives, and printed their newsletters. And many movement leaders, including conservative organizers like Richard Vigory, religious figures such as the Reverend Jerry Falwell, and journalists like Pat Buchanan, met regularly in Washington with conservative congressmen and senators to plan their strategies. And during the late 1970s, they managed to defeat picketing protections for organized labor, the creation of a new consumer protection agency, and federal financing for congressional elections. And they nearly, they only came a couple of votes shy of derailing the Panama Canal treaties. Finally, the new right in the 1970s pioneered and perfected a new mode of political communication. Like all successful political movements, Vigory explained, we must have a method of communicating with each other and for conservatives in the 1970s, that method was direct mail. Conservatives believed they had no choice but to operate outside standard channels of communication to make an end run around the traditional media that they believed were controlled by liberals. And direct mail made that possible. From his computer facility in Falls Church, Virginia, Vigory's operation alone collected the names of 15 million conservatives. Opponents so feared the power of Vigory's IBM mainframes that the head of the United Auto Workers believed that he had the capacity to generate as much money for a campaign as did the entire American labor movement. Direct mail, though, became a tool not just for fundraising, but for organization and communication as well. The purpose of direct mail, Vigory explained in 1978, isn't just money. We are building a movement. Direct mail is a way to get people involved, to educate them, to turn out the vote. It is a form of advertising, and conservatives have found a way to communicate with people and pay for that communication. And if you take a look at a couple of examples from the 1970s, I think you can see why direct mail proved so um, effective. This one was signed by Howard Phillips, the head of the Conservative Caucus. Dear friend. I think you will appreciate more than most Americans what I am sending you. I have enclosed two flags, and there were two 
little baby flags in there. The red, white, and blue of old glory, and the white flag of surrender. And then it leads you to, you know, write, to, you know, write the Senate, and, and, uh, and it mobilized thousands and thousands of communications. Or this one here from Americans for Life, signed by Ohio Representative Buzz Lukens. Please take a second right now to look at the outrageous pro-abortion political propaganda I've enclosed, and then help me stop the baby killers by signing and mailing the enclosed anti-abortion postcard to your U.S. senators. You, you'll, and right on the back is a list uh, uh, with all the addresses, so it's all, all done for you. So by the late 1970s then, the new right had become a force to be reckoned with in American national politics. And central to its success, of course, was a second key outgrowth of 1960s conservatism, the mobilization of previously quiescent evangelical Protestants into a formidable component of the conservative coalition. Now it's important to remember that a generation before the 1960s, the very idea of a Christian right would have seemed ridiculous. In particular, it hardly seemed likely that religiously motivated white Southerners would ever become a potent political force. And in fact, in 1935, a group of prominent Southern Baptist, Methodist, and Pentecostal ministers wrote to President Franklin D. Roosevelt pleading for more extensive government action. And responding to a questionnaire in a leading evangelical publication in 1935, 80% of the pastors supported the president's New Deal and almost all of the critics complained that it was not radical enough. As late as 1957, the most prominent voice in American Protestantism, the Reverend Billy Graham, invited Martin Luther King on stage with him to pray for a brotherhood that transcends color. Now, most Southern evangelical pastors disliked that message, but their principal response was not opposition, but rather to distance themselves and their flocks from any involvement in worldly affairs. In a famous 1965 sermon entitled Mar Ministers and Marchers, a sermon reprinted in a pamphlet and widely distributed, the Reverend Jerry Falwell, leader of a rapidly growing church in Lynchburg, Virginia, assailed preachers like King because they mixed politics and religion. Falwell cited a Christian pastor's duty in his words to preach the word and not reform the externals. Preachers are not called to be politicians, he explained, but to be soul winners. <clears throat> of course, Falwell would eventually change his mind. The decade after 1965 witnessed the almost miraculous growth of Falwell's own Thomas Road Baptist Church and others like it, where dynamic young pastors with mass media skills could create colossal influential institutions. And beginning with outrage reactions to the early 1960s Supreme Court decisions restricting prayer in public schools, more and more Southern evangelicals saw worldly political action as proper and necessary. The 1970s, of course, witnessed the full-blown mobilization of the Christian right around such issues as abortion, the Equal Rights Amendment, and homosexuality. But the signal episode involved the controversy over Christian academies. You see, in the late 60s and early 70s, in response to court-ordered racial integration and the banning of prayer in schools, a Christian school movement had developed. Because they were religiously oriented nonprofits, those schools were tax exempt. And a number of civil rights organizations, seeing these lily white academies as really a tool to resist racial integration, pressed the government to revoke their tax exemptions. In 1977, a Democratic president appointed a new IRS commissioner who agreed and tried to remove the exemptions. That energized a Christian right to fight against the IRS. It also linked the Christian right to the broader conservative movement's revolt against taxation. And most important, it helped mobilize a religious right that had long been politically marginal, indeed a group that had mainly avoided partisan politics and had historically low voter turnout. The Moral Majority formed in 1979 and it drew much of its staff and personnel from the Christian schools debate. Third, the third legacy of the 1960s came in the form of a new language of dissent. A conservatism focused 
not only on small government and anti-communism, but on resistance to the cultural and social upheaval of the 60s. That's the capital S-I-X-T-I-E-S, 60s. Out of the 1964 campaign would emerge this man, whose national television speech in support of Goldwater catapulted him to attention and made him a candidate for governor of California in 1966. The speech was called A Time for Choosing. I'm hoping it's gonna work. I don't know if we can see without the... So Reagan's entry into the political arena marked another important consequence of the maturation of the, um, another important sign of the maturation of the emerging new right. The future president, as he mentioned, had begun his adult life as a liberal Democrat. In 1950, he had supported Helen Gahagan Douglas, the liberal Senate candidate defeated by the young Richard Nixon in the brutal campaign during which Nixon had labeled Douglas the pink lady and suggested she was a communist agent. He had also been the head of a labor union, the Screen Actors Guild. But over the course of the 50s, he moved right, and the Goldwater campaign brought him actively into conservative politics, and two years later, he ran for governor of California. Still, as Goldwater's defeat made clear, the enthusiastic backing of movement activists did not translate into success at the ballot box. Reagan hired the best campaign managers available, even those who had worked for liberals, and much more vividly and effectively than Goldwater, Reagan could make the changes of the 60s seem exotic, horrible, dangerous. Here's a clip from his 1966 campaign for governor. Candidate for governor in 1966. During his campaign, he found that attacking what he called the message Berkeley pleased the crowd. It began a year ago when the so-called free speech advocates, who in truth have no appreciation for freedom, we're allowed to assault and humiliate the civil law under a policeman on the campus, and that was the moment when the ring leaders could have been taken to the scruff of the neck and thrown out of the university once and for all. So. Yet it was not, his communication skills were important, but it was not only his communication skill that made his effort to win over Democrats <laughs> successful, and that of some of his fellow conservatives. Things were changing by the late 60s and 1970s. There was rising discontent with and antagonism to liberalism. Hard hats, blue collar workers outraged by hippies and anti-war protesters taking to the streets. Parents, mostly northern white ethnics, hostile to forced busing. Right to lifers fighting against the legalization of abortion. Business interests resisting environmental regulation. Widespread concerns about law and order in the wake of racial disturbances and campus unrest. Hawks upset by stalemate in Vietnam. And uh, we're going to show you here one of Richard Nixon's 1968 campaign commercials, but it's really the visuals, and I, I don't think we can see it. So in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip through it. But I think one of the things it shows was that there was plenty of discontent with liberalism, yet throughout the 1960s and into the 1970s, this broad anti-liberalism had not coalesced into anything you might call a conservative coalition. Many Americans were becoming wary of liberals and liberalism, but were still unwilling to identify themselves with conservatism with its aggressive hardline anti-communism, with its ambitions to disassemble the welfare state and many beloved government programs, with its assault on unions, deregulation of business, and weakening of environmental protection. But by 1980, this vague anti-liberalism was metamorphosing into avowed conservatism. Americans were voting for Reagan, at least a sizable share of the electorate was. The grassroots organizing that went into the Goldwater campaign 
had prepared conservatives for power. Still a problem remained. To build a majority, to win elections, the new right needed to appeal to Americans who shared some of the conservatives discussed with liberal policies and politics, but who frankly found the organized conservative movement scary, too extreme, too hard-edged. Because building a winning conservative coalition required more than a well-organized, energized cadre of grassroots activists and the popular leadership and the effective communication that Reagan could provide. It also needed an issue to unite its various factions, cement its disparate multifaceted agenda, to give birth to a movement that had been gestating for a decade and a half. And that would come in the tax revolt, I'm going to skip that, in the tax revolt of the late 1970s. Now the tax revolt started in California with the passage of Proposition 13 in 1978, the first of a wave of tax cutting and service slashing popular initiatives that swept the nation. More than 20 states followed California's lead from Maine to Alaska. The tax revolt swept over high tax states like Massachusetts and low tax states like Idaho, which barely had any taxes to revolt against. The rebellion against taxes and big government that imposed them fused together many different aspects of the conservative message. The use of tax money for supposedly immoral purposes like sex education, abortion, the waste and abuses of an overweening big government, a government imposing regulations on business, a bunch of elitist bureaucrats telling ordinary Americans what to do, and even lingering racial hostility a perception in the racially polarized America of the 1970s that our tax money was being spent on them. Finally, another real grievance underlay the tax revolt, genuine economic hardship, the economic catastrophe of the 1970s that dramatically altered the way Americans saw their country, their future, their world. Together then, the ideological vigor of Buckley and Goldwater, the organizational muscle of the new right, the mobilization of Christian conservatives, and the mass discontent of the tax revolt propelled Reagan to victory. And that triumph would eventually change the very terms of American politics, of American public life. Policies and attitudes unthinkable in 1969 became middle of the road. Accepted moderate positions of the 60s and early 70s, even the conservatism of Richard Nixon would, by the end of Reagan's presidency, seem like left-wing extremism. From the 1930s to the 1970s, a broad liberal coalition had governed American life. But in 1981, all that would begin to change. A new era had begun. The kinder, gentler conservatism of the first President Bush, the chastened new Democrat agenda of Bill Clinton, who ended the federal entitlement to welfare, balanced the federal budget and declared that the era of big government is over. And the so-called compassionate conservatism of George W. Bush, a born-again Christian strongly allied with religious conservatives and a dedicated tax cutter. All of those played out the conservative ascendancy that began with a few lonely voices in the post-World War II wilderness. Now, to be sure, conservatism's triumphs were never complete. Rather, they layered themselves over the accumulated changes of the post-war era. Liberalism remained deeply embedded in national politics. Popular culture retained many impulses of the 1960s, and social movements opposing conservative values flourished. Politics and law reflected more informal shifts in sexual mores, language, dress, food, living arrangements, and social behavior. The triumphs of the right then at the ballot box and broadly across American society would take place against that backdrop, but they nonetheless proved impressive. Well, after November 2008, in the wake of substantial Democratic majorities in Congress and the election of Barack Obama, whose 53% of the popular vote was far and away the best showing for a Democrat since LBJ's 1964 landslide, many observers suggested that that election marked the end of the conservative period in American national politics. But recent events make clear that reports of that demise may have been premature. Now, to be sure, Obama won legislative achievements anathema to the right, 
that would have seemed unthinkable not all that long ago. National health insurance, repeal of don't ask, don't tell, an arms control agreement with Russia, re-regulation of Wall Street. But the president's style of governance, relying on private insurance companies to get to universal coverage rather than a public option, and its consistent concern about the long-term deficit, even amidst a major recession, suggests that the right still largely define the terms of debate. And of course, the 2010 bid terms reveal the still potent political punch of the conservative movement. So we are left, finally, with a question. Do we still live amid the conservative ascendancy that Barry Goldwater gestated and Ronald Reagan birthed? Or have we entered a new era in national political life? Only time and you will tell. Thank you.